Welcome. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. That is our substitute Liberty Bell for now. I'm President Steve Chevalier. Uh, I'm a director at uh, Zilber Limited and a member of the Zilber Family Foundation. As we gather virtually today for our 11th virtual meeting in our 107 year history, we'll continue the tradition of making uh, the pledge to the flag of the United States. Please join me in making my pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, now, Jerry Stepaniak, president of Stepaniak and Associates Consulting and the chair of our World Community Services Committee will give our invocation. Thank you, President Steve. Uh, this is a poem about a migrant woman. Look into a migrant's eyes. What you see is not the color, but uncertainty that comes with being thrown into the uncharted waters. You cannot judge books by their covers. And you cannot guess at her pain by the quality of her hair or the complexion you are so trained to belittle, to belittle and harm with your remarks your privileged mind cannot fathom. Nor comprehend why a human being leaves her home behind just for the glimmer of a distant hope amidst the tornadoes, knowing only torment and yet carrying on. So the next time you meet an immigrant, try to make her smile. For blessed are those who ease the burden of a few fellow lost souls looking for a way to belong. Thank you, Jerry, for our very thoughtful remarks. Uh, we have good news today. We have a new member to introduce. Dave Murphy, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Marquette University, is going to introduce our newest member, Meg McKenna. Uh, thanks, President Steve. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Meg McKenna, as Steve said. Meg has been the Director of the Partnership Department at Visit Milwaukee for the last eight years, and she's a proud Marquette undergrad and law school alum. Uh, Meg uh, practiced civil lit litigation for many years following her graduation in 1992. She left legal practice to stay home with her two children, and little did she know that precious time at home would lead to her next career path. Uh, she and her husband started an entrepreneurial online parent resource website, you might recall it, called MilwaukeeMoms.com, and it grew the audience to the point where it attracted the notice of the Journal Sentinel. The Journal Sentinel subsequently purchased MilwaukeeMoms.com in 2006, and Meg worked inside the journal for, for, for a few years there, representing MilwaukeeMoms.com in the journal interactive line of products. Following these years, Meg revitalized the Wauwatosa Chamber of Commerce as its executive director before being recruited by Visit Milwaukee for her current role. <clears throat> Meg would like you to know that at the heart of the twists and turns of her career path is her love of connecting people, which fits very nicely with Rotary Meg, and growing relationships and spotting gaps in the marketplace of ideas. So when Meg sent her bio to me, the email said, Dave, feel free to change up any of it. And I thought, well, I guess she has an attribute of being very trusting as well. Um, so a couple thoughts there. I'm just lucky enough to work with Meg these past seven years, six of which while serving on the Visit Milwaukee board and subsequently on initiatives to highlight Milwaukee as a college town. And I found her to be a wonderful collaborator, problem solver, networker, and tireless advocate for the city. If you're looking for someone who welcomes a challenge with a positive can-do attitude, Meg is all in and great for Rotary. And um, and as we get back to some normal, some level of normal in our post-pandemic world, if you have the good fortune of meeting offsite with Meg for say a breakfast, a lunch, or a after work cocktail, always defer to her recommendations. She knows the best places around town, hands down. So welcome, Meg. Thank you so much, Dave. That was really kind. Um, and I love working with you as well. I look forward to meeting all of you in person when uh, we all return to um, our ability to gather and giving you recommendations on where to get a great, a great breakfast or a cocktail. So thanks again. I'm, I'm so pleased to be a part of Rotary. 
Welcome to the club, Meg. Uh, I look forward to meeting you in person and thank you, Dave, for introducing her to the club. Great addition. And now, Julio Gracioso, a Rotarian and a good friend to the Milwaukee Rotary Club, will give us an update, update about the work that Rotary and Engineers Without Borders uh, has been doing in Guatemala. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all. It is a great pleasure for me sharing this meeting with you and having my hot coffee with uh, my mug of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. I see many known faces in the meeting, so very happy. And welcome, Meg, to this wonderful organization that opens so many opportunities. And uh, I want to talk about what we have done with your support here in Guatemala regarding the COVID-19. And due to its geographical position, topography and geology, Guatemala is in a very vulnerable position for natural disasters. When the socioeconomic reality is added, we find a country in an overly complicated situation. The relationship of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee and your district with Rotary Clubs of, of Guatemala began several years ago, carrying out pedestrian bridges and drinking water projects, mainly in the highlands, inhabited mostly by indigenous communities. This strong and close relationship allowed us to react in a quick way to the emergency derived from the Fuego volcano eruption two years ago. And in alliance with engineers without borders, we supported the construction of three pedestrian bridges and the repair of three more, as you can see one of those in this picture. COVID-19 has been a huge challenge for Guatemala and with Mike Paddock leaving, an international committee was established to help during this crisis. In this committee, there are not only Rotarians, but also doctors and university representatives. And we have been meeting via Zoom since March, three times a week. The strategy of, for this committee was to support with personal protection equipment for frontline personnel and improvement in the hospital infrastructure which will remain in use after the crisis. Engineers Without Borders managed an open philanthropy grant for $200,000 and 60,000 more from their organization, which added to the funds received from your club and other clubs allowed us Julio, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Julio? Contributed in these hospitals. Okay. There we go. This work has been done in coordination with the Rotary Emergency Committee, which brings together all the clubs in Guatemala. Together, we have now delivered significant amounts of personal protection equipment in addition to substantial improvements in regional hospital facilities. From the beginning, we established our interest in having an impact beyond the emergency, so we are dedicating many of our efforts in infrastructure. We are focused on the global grant for the construction of a water wall for the Squintla Hospital. It is exceedingly difficult to deal with this type of crisis without adequate water supply. Jerry Stepaniak has been a key player on getting the global grant to the Rotary Foundation for evaluation and approval. Thank you very much to all of you for making all this possible. And I want to thank you also, the president of my club, Lorena Merida, who is with us in this meeting. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all of you. Thanks for the update, Julio. Um, and now Beth Heller, Senior Director of Education and Strategic Planning at the Urban Ecology Center, has an announcement about the donations that will be made uh, with the money that our club has saved uh, by not meeting in person for lunch the last few months. Hello, 
Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, President Steve. I am uh, delighted today to share um, an update, and I'd like to first start with a thank you to the Rotary Club members. Uh, a little bit over a month ago, a survey went out asking you, what should we do about um, the, the savings? Is there, what would you like? Are you interested in, in um, supporting redirecting them, supporting it to the community? Is there is there something else you'd like to do with the funds? And in true Rotary form, um, overwhelmingly the Rotarians, over 100 Rotarians responded and they said, yes, let's let's give this back to the community. So um, so the, the board heard that in early May and assigned the task to my committee to um, figure out how to distribute those funds. So uh, first, the, the committee that was working on this is Pat Cronin, Teresa Esser, Joanne Grunau, my co-chair, Mary McCormick, Mark Ruttinger from Rotaract, and Sarah Wilson. So that was the group working on this. Uh, one of the things that we did, in addition to looking at your feedback and the things that you were recommending, is we identified some criteria that would help us decide who, who to distribute the uh, funds to, the cost savings to, is $20,000 total. Um, the criteria we selected are as follows, food symmetry. We were looking at uh, organizations that are, um, are providing food, addressing food insecurity with this nice kind of, it's coming from our table, it's going to the community's table. Um, we looked at our Johnson's Park community as a priority neighborhood uh, to focus on. Uh, we also looked at organizations that were really responding to the changing needs of the community as we were moving through uh, the, the pandemic. Um, and uh, we were looking for impact that really upholds, lifts up the dignity of the people involved. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a demonstrated need where the size of this, the gift would make a noticeable difference. And uh, we also looked at ripple effects. Would, would this gift um, be leveraged to help um, other, other organizations or entities. So those were our criteria. And I'm delighted to share that we selected five organizations. Alice's Gardens is receiving $5,000 to help um, expand their garden plots and to support a new night market that will be opening in July. Fondy Foods is receiving $5,000 for matching funds that will help People who are uh, on some food assistant programs uh, double the number of double the amount of fresh groceries that they are able to bring home to their families. Uh, we are uh, co contributing five thousand dollars to Tandem. Uh, you will hear more from Caitlin on Thursday, but this has been a really amazing uh, thing to watch a restaurant move from serving people who are uh, paying for food and transitioning into a, a soup kitchen essentially. And um, so tune in Thursday to learn more about her. Uh, St. Anne's Center uh, is receiving $2,500 to provide food to people participating in their uh, intergenerational and adult daycare programming and the House of Peace uh, for their emergency food pantry services in the Johnson's Park area. So we are delighted to uh, be able to contribute those gifts to our friends and partners in the Johnson's Park area and are extremely appreciative to the Rotary Club members for being supportive of this effort. So thank you, everybody. Well, I have great choices. Thank you, Beth, and your committee members for uh, sifting and winnowing through all those uh, suggestions we have from our club members. And importantly, thank you to all of our club members for um, agreeing to uh, help our community at this trying time. Uh, also a hearty thank you now to Teresa Esser and Karen Plunkett for their uh, presentation last Thursday about angel investments um, on our SNAC program. This program is now on your YouTube channel. So check it out. Feel free to have uh, friends and family take a look at it. It's worthy of a view. This Thursday, we welcome a friend of Rotary, Caitlin Cullen, owner of the Tandem Restaurant at Johnson's Park. Uh, Caitlin has very successfully transitioned her business from a commercial restaurant to a soup kitchen uh, during this pandemic. She'll be interviewed by Rotarian Teresa Regan. And finally, before we start our uh, speaker uh, portion of the program, remember we're doing this on Zoom. If you have a question or a comment, put it into the chat box, hit enter. Mary McCormick will monitor the questions and try to get as many answered as possible. And now, Maya Jurisic, Vice President and Medical Director for the National Accounts of Concentra, will introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon. 
As I am myself an immigrant, it's truly an honor for me to introduce today's speaker, Doris Meisner. Her career includes being commissioner of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and her topic will be immigration and COVID-19, what's the connection, what are we learning? Ms. Meisner's experience as a second generation immigrant growing up in Milwaukee in a household where German was spoken helped prepare her for her future career as head of the INS and was really critical in helping her understand the migrant perspective in a very personal way. She graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a master's in political science. From 1973 to 81, she held a variety of roles in government in DC including serving as a special assistant to the Attorney General, Deputy Associate Attorney General, and then Acting Commissioner of the INS and Executive Associate Commissioner. She moved to the private sector in 1986, but returned to government service when President Clinton nominated her as INS Commissioner. Her tenure was at a critical time for the agency. Under her watch, border enforcement was ramped up and the New York Times described her as, quote, keeping open America's front door while slamming shut the back door. She oversaw the agency when its workforce doubled to 32,000 employees and its budget tripled to 4.3 billion. She worked to reduce a backlog in naturalization applications from 2 million to 800,000 and decreased wait times from two years to nine months. Her boss, Janet Reno, called her everyone's idea of the perfect public servant. Ms. Meisner is now a senior fellow and director of the U.S. Immigration Policy Program at the Migration Policy Institute, as well as being vice chair of the Board of Trustees of the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and serving on several other prestigious boards and councils. And now I'll turn it over to our di distinguished speaker, Doris Meisner. Doris, you're on mute. You are on mute. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Am I? Can Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Mary, for the invitation to be with you today. Maya, nice to meet you. And thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I. Um, I mean, who would have imagined when we made this date uh, that the opportunity I had to make a hometown visit would turn out to be one that's mutual. Um, but that's the way it is. So I have to say, hello, Milwaukee, good afternoon. And I hope a day will return where we can actually see each other in person again. But um, meanwhile, the COVID-19 issue has been uppermost in our minds and it's shaped most everything that all of us have done individually and certainly what it is that we've been doing as a country uh, for several months now. So I'm going to be talking about a piece of that experience that we're having, and that is the connections between the virus and immigration. Now, there are lots of connections between the virus and, the immigra and immigration. I mean, they have to do with international travel, with border policies, uh, with screening foreign visitors coming to the United States. But the connection that I'm going to talk about is the connection between immigrants and the workforce in our economy uh, during this period. The disease has shined a light on many problems and failings in our society. Elements of immigration and the role of the foreign born as workers are among them. And they're bringing into view problems and gaps that need to be addressed in order to conquer the threat of pandemics as a danger to our well being as a country in the future. So let me start with just the key basics here. And that is that we have in our country today a foreign born population that represents 13.7% of our population. That uh, uh, counts out as 44 million people. And those 44 million people, that 13.7% of our population, are a mixture of naturalized US citizens, 
people who are here as permanent residents who have green cards, people that are here with temporary visas, and a share of people who do not have legal status in the country, the unauthorized population. So that population of foreign born, that is 13.7% of our population, is actually 17% of our workforce. But they're not evenly distributed throughout the workforce. And where they are in the workforce, now that we look at it through the lens of the um, of the pandemic, is a picture, it's a picture of very strong extremes. On the one extreme, there are disproportionately many more foreign born than native born in key frontline occupations that are combating the virus. The other extreme is that there are disproportionately many more foreign born than native born in occupations that have been devastated by the virus. So you have these extremes and in each extreme, there are about 6 million people. Together, they represent about a quarter of the foreign born who live in the country today. Now, I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you. Don't try to memorize them. I'm, try I'm going to give them to you to keep in mind the relative differences between this 17% of the foreign born who are in our workforce and the ways in which those people are actually distributed. There are slides available and they'll be available on the Rotary Club website afterwards if anybody wants to check back on these. But to give you the overall picture, um, let me look first at some of the frontline occupations that are involved in combating this virus, especially healthcare. Healthcare is deeply interconnected with the foreign born population. So starting with physicians, about 29% of physicians in the country today are foreign born. In very large states, such as New York, California, Texas, it's even higher than that. In those highly populated states, about a third of the physicians are foreign born. And then when you go through other healthcare occupations, you see numbers like this, 38% of home health aides, 23% of pharmacists, 22% of nursing assistants, 25% of personal care aides, 24% of those who clean hospitals and hospital rooms. So you have this picture of healthcare being absolutely, the foreign born being absolutely essential to the way in healthcare, the way in which healthcare is delivered. But it's a similar picture with other essential businesses. So those other essential businesses typically are areas of the economy that have very close contact with the public, where people are working long shifts, uh, stressful circumstances, uh, especially during the period where the public was trying to stock up and was overbuying. So that involves places like grocery stores, pharmacies, and in particular, it involves agriculture and our food supply chain. Our food supply chain and feeding America is the area where there is very much an outsized role that the foreign born play. So here we have in things like planting, growing, raising food, harvesting, processing the country's food, we have numbers like this. Again, remember, foreign born are only 17% of the workforce, but of agricultural workers, they are 30%. In crop production, they're 35%. Fruit and vegetables, 31%. Meat processing, 37%. Commercial bakeries, 34%, seafood processing, 26%. So here you have key parts of the economy, healthcare, food supply, where the workforces are heavily made up of large concentrations of immigrants that have made it possible for the rest of us in the country to be safe, stay at home. Let me turn then to the other side of this set of extremes, and that is those people who have been devastated by what's going on in the economy. 
There, again, you see heavy concentrations of immigrants. Why? Because the parts of the economy that have been heavily disadvantaged in the uh, pandemic have been the service industries. So what are we talking about? We're talking about restaurants, hotels, cleaning services and commercial buildings, personal services such as childcare, hair and nail salons, housekeeping. These tend to be workers with less than a high school education, often workers that are under the age of 25, and the highest unemployment rate right now is among Latina immigrant women. And so you can see the connection with those occupations and the kinds of people that have been in those occupations. For those who are unemployed, the social safety net has been very thin, and that's one of the things that has come through so clearly as we've seen the pandemic unfold. Across the board, people in the kinds of occupations that have been hit hardest are in jobs that do not have paid sick leave. They're not eligible often for unemployment. They are not covered by health insurance. And in a cruel twist of fate, this all had happened, all began happening, just as some fairly, fairly significant cuts in the food stamp program were being um, uh, uh, experienced or were setting in. So here you have for the foreign born that are part of those occupations and part of those job circumstances, particularly acute difficulties. Overall, the foreign born in these occupations uh, have lower incomes and larger families than their peer workers who are native born Americans. You have 30% of low income Americans are foreign born as compared to 30% of native born Americans. 28% of those who are foreign born do not have health insurance. That's twice the rate of native born Americans. 38% of the foreign born have a minor child as compared to just 23% of native born Americans. Now, some of these people, of course, have been eligible for stimulus benefits um, under the CARES Act but, uh, and, uh, and in other ways, but principally the CARES Act, but not those who are unauthorized, even though many of the unauthorized in the population pay taxes. When you look beyond the numbers and look at the overall other effects of the pandemic, what we see again is that certain groups within the foreign born have especially borne the brunt of the virus. The death rates of Latinos are next only to African Americans uh, from the virus. The hotspots where the virus has been particularly vicious are disproportionately occupied by the foreign born. So you look at cities like New York, other large cities that have congested living conditions, they are heavily populated by the foreign born. And in jobs, for example, meat processing, which you see throughout the Midwest and in many Southern states, many of the jobs that have been particularly ravaged by the virus have high concentrations of foreign born in those workplaces. So what does all this tell us going forward? Well, this is a picture that raises many issues, uh, but let me give you just three of the dilemmas that flow from these numbers and these themes that we face looking ahead. First of all, there is the obvious enormous issue of healthcare and the social safety net. That's relevant across the board as we've seen with the virus. But the immigration experience that's embedded in that is especially vivid. Because as I said, healthcare services are highly dependent on the foreign born, but many of those foreign born, especially on the lower paid rungs of the wage ladder, ladder such as home health aides, nursing home staffs don't have health insurance themselves. So they are less likely to seek care. They're less likely to have access to care. And that endangers not only themselves, but already vulnerable populations for whom they are caregivers. It's a similar story 
with food, especially in agriculture. Agriculture, of course, is an industry that has been declared essential. And people who work in agriculture actually had letters that showed that they were designated as essential employees of essential industries. But many of those workers, especially in, in agriculture, don't have any legal status. And so they too are in greater danger than many others of us, but ineligible for critical support services. That endangers them, it endangers others with whom they come in contact. But even where there has been assistance available, principally through the stimulus checks that came as a result of the CARES Act, many of the foreign born were left out. So the CARES Act, which gave checks of $1,200 to those earning less than $75,000, those people had to have a social security number. Many people in the unauthorized population don't have social security numbers. They do have internal revenue service numbers. Those are called ITIN numbers. And, um, and that's so that they can pay taxes and so that as a government, the government collects taxes. But they themselves don't have legal status, so they've been ineligible for CARES Act help. But the cruel twist to it has been that their family members have also been ineligible under the CARES Act. So you have the picture here of people paying taxes. They may not have legal status, so therefore they're ineligible for stimulus checks. But at the same time, those people who are in their families who may be US citizens also have been ineligible for those stimulus checks. That translates into 15 plus million people uh, and in their families, that includes five and a half million United States citizens. So what we have here with the social safety net, particularly well, where healthcare is concerned, uh, and stimulus checks, a real picture of policy anomalies and contradictions. A second issue that's a dilemma what we have to face going forward is the question of uh, immigration and reopening of the economy. Uh, rebuilding the economy. We have 30 plus million, possibly up to 40 million unemployed people in the country right now. Some of them are starting to go back to work. We saw with the jobs numbers last week, a surprisingly higher number than many expected. But we still have many millions, historically high levels of unemployment. So the question has to be asked, what role does immigration play in that going forward? Many people would answer that question by saying none whatsoever. Those unemployed people that are native born Americans should all be going back to work and have the chance to go back to work before anybody else. But at the same time, we have these key industries and occupations such as the ones that I've just talked about, but there are more that rely heavily on foreign born workers and that continues. There's a very close example close to home in Wisconsin, and that is the dairy industry. So this gives us another very, excuse me, very important question, and that is where is the need for immigrants and in what kinds of roles going forward? We know that rebuilding the economy will be uneven, but some immigration is likely to be needed. But that's going to be a very difficult issue to address politically with all of the native born Americans that are out of work or have been deeply harmed by the economic effects of the pandemic. So what this argues for, I think, is that we need much more flexibility in our immigration policies going forward. We need to be able to set immigration levels and adjust them up or down much more quickly in light of changing circumstances. And we really have no mechanisms in our laws to do that. The way we would get that would be through legislative changes and legislative changes certainly are going to be on the agenda going forward. This should be one of them. The final issue, the third issue that I wanna raise that has to do with dilemmas going forward is the issue of the unauthorized population. Um, hold on. 
Um, the issue of the unauthorized population laces throughout all of the things that one has to talk about and be aware of where the workforce is concerned in immigration. The, the takeaways from COVID and immigration are made all much more difficult because of the sizable unauthorized population that has been living in this country. It's a population of about 11 million people. It represents one in four of the foreign born who live in the country, but it also represents people over 60% of whom who have lived in this country for 10 years or more. So this is a population that is deeply rooted and the pandemic actually shows how deeply rooted the population is because they are workers who are essential and they have been working in ways that are very relevant to the broader well-being of all Americans. I'm, I'm going to try to illustrate this by uh, something that Peggy Noonan recently wrote. Uh, you may remember Peggy Noonan uh, was a speechwriter in the Reagan administration, and, and she has since then become a columnist uh, in many outlets, but she writes a weekly column in the Wall Street Journal that is really always very provocative and very on point. But pertinent to this issue is the fact that she survived a bout with COVID that was quite, uh, that lasted a long time. And so she's written about it with very personal experience. She summed it up really quite well recently um, in writing this. She says, as to immigrants, you have seen who's delivering the food, stocking the shelves, running the hospital ward, holding your hand when you're on the ventilator. It is the newest Americans, immigrants, and some are here illegally. They worked through an epidemic and they kept America going. She says some in the immigration debate have argued they have to demonstrate they deserve citizenship. They need to pay punitive fines. They should jump through hoops. They need to earn it. Ladies and gentlemen, look around, she says. They did it. Well, that's not a sentiment that is shared by all, but it does put a fresh and a different twist on the need to address the problem of a large unauthorized population living in our country. So I'm going to close with that. And unfortunately, I have to close on an indeterminate note because we're still very much in this experience. We don't know where it's going to take us and where policy changes flowing from it ahead might lie. But what we are learning should change how we think about key elements of immigration in this picture, how it's truly working today, and what we could do to fix it. So thank you so much for your attention and your interest. I'm most happy now to answer your questions. Well, thank you, Doris. That was, um, as we would expect, um, a very thoughtful and um, carefully written and very thought out um, presentation. And it was really, has given us a lot of good food for thought. Um, and um, as we will we'll look to our chat box and we'll get some questions. One of the questions that, that came in um, pretty quickly was, we haven't heard a lot lately about what's going on at the border of on, on our southern border. Do you have any updates on that? Yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, am I, am I, do I need to unmute? No, you're good. We can hear okay. you. Okay, no, I'm That's good. good. So uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, there is a real update on the border and that is that um, <clears throat> as we know, uh, this administration has been very, very uh, committed to uh, changing enforcement policies at the border and being able to deliver on uh, uh, the promise of the wall uh, that was part of the 2016 campaign and uh, has been very, very um, uh, uh, aggressively working to shut down the crossing, particularly of Central Americans at the Southwest border, which is primarily the flow that now exists in the Southwest. And, um, uh, but the, 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 the most recent action has actually fundamentally brought the Southwest border to a standstill, to a shutdown, and that has been a health order, an order that was delivered by the CDC under authorities that are health, emergency health authorities at 
the beginning it was to last for 60 days, but it has now been extended indefinitely. And so we have a new authority that Border Patrol agents are exercising called expulsion. It's not anything that has ever been part of the immigration law. It goes back to laws passed predating our immigration enforcement legal structure at the Southwest border. And nobody quite knows where that is ultimately going to go because people are now being expelled under a part, a set of procedures for which enforcement agents have not been trained and what their rights are, if they have any at all, what the responsibilities of enforcement are at the border are now in total limbo. Are they being expelled if they're COVID positive or is there a range of reasons why they're being expelled? They're being expelled because of the generic belief that keep people coming from outside of the country could have COVID, could bring infection into the country, but there is not testing that confirms that. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Are the unauthorized workers counted in the unemployment figures? Yes, they are. Okay. And, and, uh, and you can see why, because they're, because they are particularly, uh, because they are, uh, you know, as we've said, uh, an important part of the workforce and particularly in some of the uh, most highly affected occupations. So these would be people with ITNs. Right. Uh, well, it's interesting. I, I'll, there are many in the unauthorized population that do have social security numbers, but okay. they'll typically be false social security numbers. Uh, uh, so there are certainly people that are paying taxes and employers paying taxes into the social security system, but into accounts that people can't claim their earnings from. And then the rest are items because that's internal revenue service numbers, yes. And so there, there could be some people who are being paid cash under the table for work that they're doing, and they would not be in the unemployment number, but well, they, or not. They, they probably would be in, in the un okay. unemployment numbers because the unemployment numbers are, are developed from uh, businesses and, uh, you know, uh, workforce reporting. Good. Okay. Can you speak to our national demographic trends in the U.S.? Will the U.S. have enough workers in the near term or the long term, and perhaps you know, near term we're struggling a bit, but you know, if you look two to five years out, what are your thoughts? Well, that's of course the what, what is heavily embedded in the question of what role does immigration play in the future? Because we are an aging society, uh, we do in certain parts of the labor force need younger workers. Uh, the 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 birth rate, the US native born birth rate mm -hmm. is basically net negative. I mean, the, ver the birth rate, let me say that differently. The, sure. the degree to which there is, the degree to which younger workers are being added to the workforce from, uh, uh, from native born Americans okay. is basically from those who are immigrants. So our birth rate is uh, not growing and, the and, and we're aging. And if we're going to have younger workers, some of that would need to come from immigration. Now, we of course could have a country that has a smaller economy, that has uh, less younger workers, but basically in order for the economy to grow and in order for productivity to increase, you need younger workforce. And that comes almost solely today from immigration. Thank you for that. Um, but in addition to what's going on with COVID-19, we've also been really rocked by the protests over the past two weeks. Are there ties to immigration with the protesting that we're seeing? Well, as a matter of fact, there are in that, in, in the first place, of course, the protests that are going on, uh, although they are primarily driven by and concerned with the police brutality, that African Americans experience, that experience is not limited to African Americans. The issues of police brutality and systemic racism are very much part of 
the impact being felt by all communities of color. And with the issues of systemic racism that are being raised through the protests, it really is important to remember how racism is baked into our immigration laws and our immigration history from the very outset. You know, the, the, the immigration laws that were enacted in the 1800s when the large groups of immigrants uh, uh, came to settle the West, moving westward from the country and, and immigrants in the 1890s, 1910, and so forth prior to the First World War that were part of the Industrial Revolution. The only restrictions on those groups had to do with uh, uh, if you were not going to be able to earn a living in the country, if you were going to become a public dependent, if you were uh, had particular diseases, say conjunctivitis, which couldn't be uh, pre-antibiotics were going to make you blind over time and therefore you wouldn't be able to work. There were what, what those are called qualitative restrictions. But in 1921, after the First World War, when we passed the first numerical restrictions to immigration, which is why earlier immigration, the whole idea of illegal immigration didn't even exist before, 19, before the 1920s because there were no numerical limits. But once we put in numerical limits after World War I, we began to select immigrants based on their national origin. And because the national origin at that time was heavily European and Southern European, Eastern European, the large share of immigration from that time on was European. But that national origin system lasted until 1965. It was a heavily discriminatory system. It, very, it heavily, uh, uh, made it, it made it impossible for most Asians, uh, most Latin Americans to come to the United States. And that's a fairly recent history. So racism in the way that we now are being forced to talk about it again and confront it is very much a part of our immigration history. If you fast forward that to today, the issues of policing, the way in which policing is taking place, the objections in the way that policing is affecting communities of color very much applies to immigrants and applies to the foreign born because today our foreign born uh, and our immigrants are almost entirely Asian and Latin American. And we have seen the kinds of buildup in our border enforcement at the Southwest border as well as some of the ways in which interior enforcement takes place through the Department of Homeland Security. Many of the issues of heavy, heavy policing and a real, a, 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 a real schism between the communities that are affected by it and the way in which the enforcement takes place. So I think that as this conversation moves forward, that is being generated by the police brutality and by the history of African-Americans in this country. The immigration history is a different history. The African-American history is unique. We should never try to blur the two, but they do have parallels that are very much afflicting us as a society today. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any more questions on the uh, in the chat right now. Um, is there anything else you want to just mention before we go? And we just have a couple minutes before we need to wrap up. You know, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Let me see if there's anything else. I guess I would say that the one other area that is a connection between immigration and what's going to be facing us with COVID and going forward does have to do with international travel and with international mobility and with screening people coming into the United States. And where we try to picture what that future looks like, I think it is important to look at back at what happened after 9-11 when we really changed in entirely fundamental ways 
how we as Americans travel. We're all, you know, have, taking all kinds of clothes off and so forth as we go to get bored on airplanes. We have stood up an entirely new agency, the Transportation Security Agency, that is now part of our patterns at airports. I would not be surprised if we start to see travel screening and U.S. enforcement officials at borders and airports very closely integrated with public health efforts and with very different ways of traveling that involve taking our temperatures, uh, possibly even having apps on our devices that are able to detect whether people have or have not tested for COVID. Very, very mm. different and in many ways seemingly threatening things that will raise privacy issues as well as public health and personal safety issues. But depending on how things work out with this pandemic, what we see in the fall, what happens with a vaccine, lots of things that have to do with mobility and therefore immigration might also become implicated in the future. Well, thank you. And actually, we've got a couple more questions pop up here. One is, do you have any comment on immigrant uh, medical personnel in small towns? Well, an awful lot of medical personnel in small towns have been immigrant doctors because there have been incentives for foreign trained doctors to uh, in order to be in the United States to practice in rural areas, which are heavily underserved. And I think that that too is something that is going to be part of the conversation going forward, where we try to sort out where immigration fits in the workforce of the future, because foreign trained medical personnel have been important lifelines in underserved rural areas. Great. And um, President Steve um, has a closing question here. And he says, like, are you optimistic that things are going to improve, that we're going to solve these problems? <laughs> well, <laughs> of course, we have, of course. To, <laughs> of course, we have to be optimistic and, and we have to, you know, we have to recognize that um, uh, that sometimes when you're in the midst of crises and when you're in the midst of huge historic changes, it's always going to be very messy and uh, uh, contradictory and complex. But um, uh, but this is a time where we need to uh, rise to the occasion. And uh, yes, I think we need to do so. And I hope we'll do so. And I think we have the capacities to do so. Well, thank you, Doris. And um, we're going to listen to the virtual applause that I know is coming your way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate taking the time to join us via Zoom today. I, we would much rather, of course, have had you here in person. And I know you would like to be visiting Wisconsin. So hopefully we'll, we'll get you back here soon. So I'm going to turn this back to um, President Steve. Thank you, Doris. Uh, it's a Thank very you. complex problem, obviously. <clears throat> I'm glad you're optimistic. That wasn't supposed to be a gotcha question. <laughs> uh, as you probably know, Rotary has been a uh, significant leader in the world's effort to eradicate polio. So in honor of your presentation today, Doris, we're going to purchase another 50 doses of uh, the vaccine to get us that much closer to a polio-free world, and also to help with the COVID-19 infrastructure that Rotary has helped with, along with the Gates Foundation and many others. Um, so tonight, as a reminder from uh, last week's program, America's Socialist Experiment premieres on Milwaukee PBS at 8 p.m. with Mike Boucher and Lynn Sprangers. Uh, it looks to be a very uh, good and informative program with our unique history here in Milwaukee. Uh, also, Rotary and the Florentine Opera are co-hosting the Quarantine Opera Book Club on Wednesday at 5 p.m. A cocktail idea will be provided as well. This week, the opera is Aradne of Naxos by Richard Strauss. So if you'd like to join, uh, please email Michelle or visit the link that you got in this morning's email. Uh, those are great sessions, by the way. They're a lot of fun. Our beer connector is going to meet in person this Thursday at the Hubbard Park Beer Garden. Life, life resumes. The beer garden has spaced their tables and limits the number of people at each table to enforce social distancing. 
They also have a dedicated cleaning staff to make you feel safe. Join the group at 5.30 for some socially distanced rotary socializing. Contact member Scott Glidden um, if you're interested or have any questions. Uh, also, there's a great uh, people of action in our uh, connecting newsletter. Uh, Sergeant at Arms Barbara Velez did a cameo of Grady Crosby, member Grady Crosby, who's the Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer at Johnson Controls and also the president of the Johnson Controls Foundation. If you looked at that article, you saw a picture of him with a, a very famous man, Emmett Smith. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a really a worthwhile read about a very interesting life that Grady has led thus far. And he's got some very interesting comments on the current situation, which are well worth reading. Uh, next week, join us to celebrate our 2020 Rotary Person of the Year. It'll be Paula Kiley. Uh, she's the director of the Milwaukee Public Library, so it looks to be a good program. Uh, as we close the meeting today, uh, let's all continue to do some good in the world this week. Stay healthy, stay smart as our communities begin to reopen. This meeting is